Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our morning service. Uh, as you can see, we are able to record again in the church building. Uh, and as I came in this morning, I have been calling to mind, I've been remembering uh, the church family gathered here in worship. Uh, sitting in our different homes, it definitely does take an exercise of perhaps uh, imagination uh, to remember that we are still together this morning. Uh, we are united in worship. Uh, and even though this building is still empty, the church and our church here at All Souls is still very much alive. And we still have our vision and our mission to live out together, to be all for Jesus. And so as we begin, we are going to set our eyes and our hearts on him, the one who is still risen, who's still reigning, and who is our righteousness and our holiness and our redemption. Let's sing together. now come to a time of confession uh, where we acknowledge our sin, where we bring it before the Lord, and we ask for his continued grace and mercy. So let's pray together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much our own ways and the desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have failed to do what we ought to have done, 
and we have done what we ought not to have done, and we cannot save ourselves. Yet, Lord, have mercy upon us, helpless sinners. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all people by Jesus Christ, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live a godly, righteous, and disciplined life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, having brought our sin to the Lord, God's word assures us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And in the midst of all of the uncertainty and the anxiety, we can still pray with expectation and confidence the Christian family prayer. So let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Upon that day, the greatest love, the punishment that should have fallen on us, upon him, upon him, upon his head, a crown of thorns, upon his heart, a broken the wage of sin, the weight of our transgressions, upon him, upon him. Christ has died, we are forgiven and Christ alive. We are the risen and he shall come again. Praise the King, praise the King. Upon our hearts, His name is written, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're pouring out a song of praise together upon Him, upon Him. Christ has died, we are forgiven and Christ alive. We are the risen and he shall come again. Praise the King, praise the King. Christ has died. We are forgiven and Christ alive. We are the risen and he shall come again. Praise the King, praise the King. One name upon our lips, Jesus. No greater name than this, Jesus. And every knee will bow, every heart confess, Jesus, Jesus, one name upon our lips, Jesus, no greater name than this, Jesus, and every knee will bow. Confess, Jesus, Jesus, Christ has died. We are. 
King, praise the King. Sing, Christ has died. We are forgiven at Christ alive. We are the risen, and He shall come again. Praise the King, praise the King. Christ has died, we are forgiven and Christ alive. We are the risen and he shall come again. Praise the King, praise the King. Please join us as we pray together now for our world and our church. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can bring all of our concerns to you. We pray that you would guide and give wisdom to governments in all nations as they make key decisions in this difficult time. We cry out to you in particular for the vulnerable, and for those countries that are facing the coronavirus without sufficient resources. We pray that they would know your help and mercy and that many would come to trust the Lord Jesus as their saviour. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we pray for all our mission partners serving around the world. And today especially, we give you thanks for Robbie working with refugee children and their teachers in the Middle East. We pray for refugees across the region who find themselves in a much worse situation due to the pandemic. Give them strength and perseverance. May they find their refuge in you. We thank you for the compassion of churches in the Middle East, reaching out to refugees and supporting them. In these difficult financial times, please soften people's hearts so that funding for key projects would continue. In Jesus' name, Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for the persecuted church and ask that you would strengthen believers from Muslim, Hindu and Buddhist backgrounds in Sri Lanka who face harassment and discrimination from their families and communities. May they know how much you love them. Please comfort the families of those killed in the Easter Sunday attacks last year, when churches and hotels were targeted by Islamic extremists. We ask that those caught up in the attacks would receive long-term trauma care and counselling, and that you would help families who have lost their main breadwinner to survive. May their courage and example inspire and embolden fellow believers around the world. Amen. Dear Father, we... Thank you for saving us and bringing us into your family. And we thank you for your family, the church around the world, as well as here at All Souls. And we pray that as we enter this time of the interregnum, you'll be giving wisdom to Johnny, Steve and the senior ministry team as they lead and guide us as a church and that we will be able to support them well so that we might all be all for Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you to the ministry trainees for leading us in prayer this morning. Last Sunday, we said goodbye to Hugh and Claire, but it's still not too late to say thank you with a gift or a card. If you'd like to contribute to Hugh and Claire's leaving gift, the easiest way to do this is online. Just go to allsouls.org slash Hugh. And the easiest way to send a thank you message is to send it on a postcard. Send it to the All Souls Church office Mark it for the attention of Ramona. The address, of course, is to All Souls Place, London, W1B, 3DA. Hugh helpfully left us with the reminder that the gospel adventure continues. 
that Jesus is building his church. Our new vision is to be all for Jesus. Do you remember life before COVID-19? Do you remember Sunday, the 19th of January, when we all got up out of our church seats, walked onto the chancel behind me and wrote our names on a big yellow board committing to be all for Jesus? Hopefully all of you will have your yellow cards somewhere in view, stuck on your fridges or somewhere around your home. With this verse, from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 on it. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. A timely verse for us these past couple of months, and a verse for us as we look to the future. It's a calling to pray. On the 2nd of June, a week on Tuesday, we have a day of prayer and fasting to continue to pray for many who need our prayers during COVID-19, to pray for our nation and our world, and to pray for the future of our church. Now, you may never have fasted before. We'll do it together. And we'll pray together online using Zoom for 20 minutes on the hour, every hour, from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. It would be great if you could pick a slot or two to join in. And you can find out more details on our website, allsouls.org. It's that point in the service when we usually take up our offering. Thank you so much for the way you have cared for the church with your generous financial support. And as we remind each other every week, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Please pick up your Bibles. Stephen Kempsell, one of our mission partners with Missionary Aviation Fellowship, is going to read God's word to us today. Good morning. My name is Stephen Kempsell, and I'm an All Souls mission partner serving with Mission Aviation Fellowship. Do please pray for us as we share the love of Christ through aviation and technology in some of the world's most isolated regions, especially during this time of COVID-19 response. This morning's reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 1 and verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, 
as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. A few months ago, I had a checkup at the opticians and was prescribed reading glasses. For a while, whenever I led a communion service here at All Souls, I'd found it easier to look down at a large print Bible than my old little pocket Bible. But I didn't realize how bad my eyesight had become until I put my glasses on and suddenly everything jumped into focus with a sharpness I hadn't even realized I was missing. The cross of Christ is like that. We think we understand life, ourselves, the world, until we look through the lens of the cross and suddenly everything looks different. Throughout this letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul shows the Christians in Corinth what all the issues they were facing look like when looked at properly through the lens of the cross. Power and wisdom in the culture, personalities and church unity, leadership, disagreements, lawsuits, sex, marriage and singleness, food, freedom, spiritual gifts. We've called this series of studies in 1 Corinthians True Spirituality. And we'll see that at the heart of true spirituality is the cross. To grow as a Christian is to learn to see everything through the lens of the cross, to see things as they really are. If you have a Bible there, do pick it up and turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The first challenge we face as we look at these verses this morning is that the cross has become so familiar to us that it's become dulled. It's like a coin that's been in circulation for years. It doesn't grab us or startle us as it did in the first century. You see, crucifixion was a horrific way to die. It was the supreme penalty reserved for rebels and slaves. No Roman citizen could be crucified except by the express permission of the emperor. It carried out outside the city walls where Rows of crosses offered rich pickings for hungry birds. Crucifixion was considered so disgusting, it wasn't even discussed in polite company. Cicero famously commented that the very word cross should be removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, his ears. It's no surprise then, as historian Tom Holland notes, that very few detailed descriptions of crucifixions even survive in ancient literature. But there's one exception. Four detailed accounts have come down to us of one man's crucifixion. Accounts which are the climax of what in Greek was called the euangelion, the good news, or in English, the gospel. Good news about a crucifixion would have sounded like a sick joke in the first century. But that was the message God sent Paul to preach. And Paul could no more think of Christianity without the cross than we could think of Christopher Columbus without America or Mozart without music. In verse 18, he calls the gospel the message of the cross. Writing to the church in Corinth around AD 54, Paul drags the Corinthians back to the cross. He wants them to see everything through the lens of the cross and he needs them to do it. Corinth was wealthy and sophisticated. It was proud of its economic clout, its reputation, and the way it presented itself as a successful and powerful place. A message stamped throughout by a terrible crucifixion. Well, that was not the sort of sophisticated message that Corinth wanted. The church itself seems to have reconstructed their spirituality without the embarrassment of the cross. You can hear them. Oh, we're Corinthians. 
The message of the cross isn't going to fly here, Paul. There are clever people in this city. There are clever ideas around. And you're going to wheel out the cross? No, we need something a bit wiser than that. Writing last year in his book, Outgrowing God, Richard Dawkins, perhaps best known of the new atheists, concluded the doctrine of the atonement, which Christians take very seriously indeed, is so deeply, deeply nasty that it deserves to be savagely ridiculed. Well, ridiculing the cross is nothing new. Verse 18 tells us the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We don't naturally like the message of the cross. Its implication is deeply offensive. As the 20th century German martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, the cross is God's truth about us. Written in blood on a wooden beam, it tells us that we're not wise enough to know him. We're not strong enough to save ourselves. The cross closes off all other options. It declares that no other way of salvation works. If there were any other way we could be saved, the death of Christ on the cross wouldn't be needed. But at the cross, God took our sin on himself and suffered his own divine judgment in our place. The cross divides the human race. Ultimately, there are only two kinds of people. Those who are perishing, according to verse 18, and those who are being saved. Those who find the cross foolishness and those who know it is God's power to forgive us and rescue us from his wrath. In eternity, it won't matter if you were educated or not, if you were a high earner or on the minimum wage. Justice and righteousness in society, they are important, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to eternity, the only thing that will matter is whether the cross was foolishness to you or the life-transforming power of God. As you listen to this this morning, I don't know who you are. Perhaps you've wandered away from a Christian background. Perhaps you're coming to this for the very first time. How can you know God? How can you get right with him? The only way, this passage says, is through the death of Jesus Christ in your place on the cross. The cross, it was a stumbling block to the Jews. A crucified Messiah didn't meet their expectations, verse 22. It was foolishness to the Greeks. A God who sacrificed himself to forgive his enemies, it didn't fit into their categories. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Paul writes, Christ is both the power and wisdom of God. God dictates the terms. Oh, it does sound foolish. It always has, but don't let that move you. The message of the cross is God's power of salvation. We want to persuade others. Paul did again and again. We want to reason and think hard and use our minds, but we do all this only to present the cross. We do this because as Paul concludes in verse 25, the cross in all its foolishness and weakness does what human wisdom and power can't do. Yes, it was ugly, a brutal way to die. It is repulsive, foolish, unsophisticated, until the moment we receive it as God's wisdom and power for us. Then, as one of the old hymns describes it, it becomes the wondrous cross. We're going to pause for a few minutes and listen to that hymn. Listen to the words. And if God is calling you to himself, then why not make them your own this morning?
It was 200 years ago during the great revivals of the 18th century here in Britain, where many thousands of ordinary working people became Christians, that the newly converted Countess of Huntingdon said that she was saved by the letter M. It was the difference in verse 26 between not any of noble birth and not many. We've looked at God's foolish message in verses 18 to 25. Now in verses 26 to 31, Paul turns to the gospel's foolish believers. He wants the Corinthians to see themselves again through the lens of the cross. Corinth was a strategic place. The commentators tell us that its location and its two harbors made the city of great economic importance. And culturally, Corinth saw itself as sophisticated and intellectual. Tourists flocked to Corinth every two years for the famous Isthmian Games, second only to the Olympics. In business, trade, social status, economic power, the Corinthians were driven and competitive. It was no surprise when they became Christians that they carried much of this into the church too. Again, you can hear them saying, oh, we're the church in Corinth. We're strategic. Look at our location. And true enough, it was a wonderful mission field. But Paul challenges their iceberg of pride that is floating just under the surface. Verse 26, brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called, he writes. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. None of us likes to be thought foolish or weak. We try and hide our weaknesses and present our best side. We want people to admire us. That's the wisdom of the world, whether you're in Corinth or London or anywhere else. But the cross tells us that we're not wise, that we couldn't work out who God is. We had to be told. The cross tells us we're not strong. We couldn't save ourselves. We're weak. We had to be rescued. There's no place for pride. Oh, there was the odd influential Corinthian in the young church. Crispus, the former leader of the Jewish synagogue. Erastus, a, a leading civil servant. But by and large, the Christians in Corinth were from humble backgrounds. And it's always been like that. By and large, the successful and influential in the world's eyes find the humbling message of the cross hard to accept. It's hard to accept that your privilege counts for nothing at the cross. It's hard to hear that when it comes to salvation, a successful career is irrelevant. The rich young man found it hard to put Jesus before his riches. The cross levels us. Perhaps that's why in Philippi, Paul was happy to accept support from the Christians there, but in Corinth, he insisted on earning his living as a tent maker to the embarrassment of some in Corinth who perhaps valued their professional status a little too much. What would Paul write to all souls, I wonder? Many of us would be considered wise by human standards. By God's grace, some in our congregation have positions of influence in professional or public life. And whatever financial challenges we're facing, by almost any measure in the world's eyes, we're rich. All the more reason, I think, why Paul would tell us to see ourselves through the lens of the cross. To remember that we brought nothing to our salvation. It is because of him, Paul writes, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness holiness and redemption. When I was at university, I was part of the boat club. I remember one of the series of races we had one year. In our group was a crew from one of the graduate colleges. We never saw them out training, they never practiced. But when the day of the races began, 
In their boat were two German Olympic oarsmen. Day after day, these two giants powered their boat along until by the end of their week, the crew had won every race and earned their coveted oar to hang on the wall. The other six rowers in the boat did nothing at all. If anything, they slowed it down. They certainly had nothing to boast about in themselves. Someone else did the work, but they got the prize. And the cross reminds us that we couldn't earn our forgiveness. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Whatever our background, left to ourselves, we are foolish, guilty, sinful, and enslaved. But in Christ, we're given God's wisdom. We're declared right with him. Our sins are forgiven, and we're made holy. No wonder that in verse 31, Paul quotes from Jeremiah 9, Let not the wise man boast of their wisdom or the strong men boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that he knows and understands me and that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice and righteousness on earth. So the cross is God's foolish message. Christians are the gospel's foolish believers. And as we come to an end, let's look thirdly at Paul's foolish preaching in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. In Corinth, if you wanted a night out, you didn't go to the pub or the cinema, you went to listen to one of the famous public speakers showing off their skills. You see, presentation was everything for the Corinthians. I guess if they'd had a church Instagram page, it would have been filled with pictures of the best-looking Christians in the church with bleached white teeth and perfect skin and highly toned bodies. Their outreach to the rest of Corinth would have been fronted by Christians with the good looks of models, the intellects of geniuses, and the persuasive skills of spin doctors. Enter Paul. Paul was a bit of an embarrassment to the Corinthians. He didn't have the presence so valued by their society. I suspect that when Paul entered a room, most people didn't even notice. Perhaps the Corinthians wished Paul would display the kind of impressive qualities that would boost their status as a church or win the respect of the city around them. But all that thinking was exactly why Paul deliberately renounced such worldly wisdom. See, when you understand that you cannot know God through the wisdom of the world, but only through the cross, you try to scrub yourself clean of that worldly wisdom because it corrupts the gospel. When I came to you, Paul reminds them in chapter 2, verse 1, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. The last thing Paul wanted to be was another city centre celebrity speaker. No, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not that he spoke of nothing but the cross, but the cross shaped everything he spoke about. The cross was the lens through which he saw the world. Don't hear me wrongly. It's not that presentation is unimportant. Whatever we do, we want to do it as well as we possibly can. It's no credit to the Lord to be sloppy or thoughtless in the way we present the gospel. But it's very easy for concern about how we present the gospel to overshadow what we're presenting. Whether it's quietly ignoring the commands of scripture if they jar with our culture, or manipulating emotions through clever use of music and lighting, or preaching that merely strokes the intellect. Appeal to worldly wisdom in any way like this, and we're leaving behind God's foolish message of the cross, God's power for salvation. Paul highlights the danger in verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, he writes so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. If people responded to human techniques, you had to question whether theirs was a genuine conversion at all. Oh, Paul's preaching did have a power to change lives, but it was the power of the cross, carefully explained and personally applied by the Holy Spirit. God's foolish message. 
the gospel's foolish believers, Paul's foolish preaching. True spirituality centers on the cross. It saves us and shapes us. The cross ought to transform the way we look at everything in life. It's only through the cross that life begins to make sense. Things come into focus with a sharpness you didn't know was missing. If you're investigating the Christian faith, please do have a look at our church website, allsouls.org forward slash explore. But perhaps you want to begin today. If so, let me lead us in a prayer before we sing again. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Almighty God, we confess to you that we're not what we should be. We've lived without you. We've pushed you away and deserve your judgment. But in your love, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross in our place. He faced what should have been ours. He died for our sins and rose again as Lord and Master. As best we can, we ask that what he did might be for us. Forgive us, we pray. Give us new life and help us become more like Christ as we read and obey his word each day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our final song this morning now. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection.
Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been great to have you with us. As we draw to a close, let me lead us in a final prayer. Let's pray. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Heavenly Father, draw near to those who are seeking you, and may they know your mercy and kindness. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of us today and forevermore. Amen.